Greetings and welcome to my channel, Take Control of Your Health. I'm Dr. Corey Stern. And if this is your first time watching, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you and recommend that you check out all of the other videos that we have posted on this channel because all of them are there to help you not to be a victim of the bad guys who are trying to make you sicker, weaker, and stupider. And if you're returning Viewer, I want to thank you so much for your support, all of your comments and your and your questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. I answer if you have questions, I answer you as quickly as I can. And um, I want to encourage you to please, if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button right now. And if you like the content today, please. Uh, hit the like button because it does help other people to find the, the videos. And most importantly, if you know someone that you think would benefit from this information, please share it with them. So today I'm really, really happy and excited and really thrilled to uh, introduce my guest, who is somebody I've known and respected for a really long time, who has so much expertise. She's been a mentor. She's taught me so much about herbs. And um, I had the pleasure of, of traveling to where she lives in Australia and to learn directly from her. So this is Amanda Williams and um, she's a, a doctor of uh, naturopathy, correct? And yes. she's internationally experienced integrative naturopath and medical herbalist based in Brisbane, Australia. And she specializes in women's health and has over 20 years in clinical practice. She has a strong commitment to addressing the root cause of ill health to deliver long-term sustainable health solutions, just like me. And with a deep passion for the art and science of botanical therapy, she's able to convey the magical properties of plants and their health benefits. Since 2001, she's presented seminars to health professionals in the US, Canada, UK, and Australia. And she believes that optimal health is a personal priority, but also knows that our busy lifestyles can take over and we may neglect our health, uh -huh, or we, uh, just take it for granted that our bodies will keep functioning as they always have. It's only when we get really sick uh, with recurrent infections, pain, or chronic disease that we realize it's time to do something about our health. But as you probably know, it can be overwhelming. Yet most of us would agree that being healthy is critical to being able to perform at work, earn a living, support our families, and enjoy life. Many of us view our retirement years as an opportunity to enjoy travel, hobbies, and a lifestyle we've never had the time for. But what if you're not healthy enough to do any of this? It's never too early or too late to start really understanding how to take care of your precious health and implementing practical strategies. And yes, I am obviously 100% in agreement with all of that. And that's what we talk about on this channel. So. Today, I wanted to really get into the topic of the importance of sleep in relation to your health. I've mentioned it in previous videos. I've touched on it. I always mention it. If I give you a list of, of requirements to actually stay healthy, sleep is always on the list. But um, Amanda is an expert in that topic. <clears throat> and so... I wanted uh, her to give her uh, wisdom regarding this. So Amanda, what can you tell us about the importance of sleep? Well, thank you so much, Lori, and hello, everybody. Um, sleep, I would consider to be the number one thing you can do for your health. And I never used to think that. It's only based on research that has been exploding in the last five to 10 years that we now understand that so many aspects of health are improved or negated by sleep issues. So if we've got poor sleep, our conditions get worse and vice versa. So I'd like everybody who's listening to think about 
the last time that they were able to wake up in the morning feeling like they have bags of energy and could jump out of bed and just power through the day? Or are you reaching for a cup of coffee or some other caffeinated drink? And so you've got to really think about have you normalized a poor sleep pattern, which is what I see in the majority of my patients is that when we start digging into understanding what their sleep is like, how bad is it? And we always do a sleep diary, which we can talk more about when we get into the the strategies that we'll do with every every person and what you can do if you're not one of our patients and you know to help yourself but let's put it in perspective there was a survey done in 2018 in the United States that showed that 80 percent of Americans said that they had sleep problems at least once a week so at least once a week now what we know is that even just one night of partial sleep deprivation, as they call it. So if you've had one night of disturbed sleep, for example, your inflammation in your body increases twofold. So they've shown that in studies that your inflammation, particularly in your immune cells, increases by over twofold. So that's just one night of partial sleep loss so thinking about your sleep over the last week when did you have a really good night's sleep and then um, over a third of people have less than the recommended seven to eight hours sleep per night so that's over one third of the American population that's walking around with sleep deprivation and sleep loss so now for the women who I focus on mainly in my practice sleep uh, disturbance is twice as much as men. Now that may be due to raising a family and you're on the acute alert to get up to the baby and then that never sort of really dies Goes out, away. you know. Yeah. yeah, you're still doing it, aren't you? And mm-hmm. um, 40% of Americans report being sleepy during the day. And so to the extent that it interferes with their work or their school, and they feel so drowsy and foggy headed. So that's 40% of people. So if you're looking at your family or your group of friends, or for us as doctors, we're looking at our patients and saying every single person we need to address sleep with, and for, there's really good reasons for your overall health, which we can go into. But to get your attention to listen further in this video, If you sleep less than six hours a night, you're more likely to fall asleep whilst driving. And over 16% of fatal motor vehicle accidents are caused by drowsy driving, right? So that's just only if you sleep six hours or less a night. And we've had this popular myth over the years that you only need four hours sleep. You know, some of these sort of famous politicians like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher or some business, you know, leading business entrepreneurs talk about you only need four hours a night. The sleep research absolutely contradicts that. You need seven to eight hours of sleep per night and good quality sleep. Very important. So shall we talk about what this means for your health if you don't get enough sleep? <laughs> yeah, I one of the things that um, I've come to understand, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that you secrete most of your human growth hormone while you're in your deep stages of sleep. And, you know, I, t- I talk to my patients about that too, because that's your anti-aging hormone, that's your recovery hormone, isn't it? That's right. So a lot of repair, regeneration, and just overall rebuilding of the body occurs at night. And so if you're lacking in energy, like the majority of the population, sleep is your number one remedy to improve your energy levels. And that's all to do with the restoration and repair that happens. And you're 
you, your human growth hormone, the main secretion is during the night. Plus also, if we think about weight and appetite issues, which is a lot of people, we worry about our weight, we worry about how we can lose weight, for example. Well, there's studies that have shown that if you get a good night's sleep, you actually decrease your hunger hormone, which is ghrelin. I call it greedy ghrelin to make you remember that it's your hunger hormone makes you want to eat more. You actually decrease that hormone production or secretion. So you have more satiety. So you would therefore eat less. And they also show that sleep loss triggers you to want more carbohydrates, more high fat, high calorie foods. So you can actually change your appetite by changing your sleep pattern. So there's your weight loss mechanism. <laughs> it's not as simple as that, obviously, but sleep is a core part of weight loss and helping yourself to maintain a healthy weight, which is what we want for the long term. Also, um, science has shown that adults who sleep less than the recommended seven hours a night are more likely to have at least one or more of the top 10 chronic health diseases. So things like type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. So if you would like to have health for the long term, sleep is one of your best remedies. Our immune system, which is very, very important as our primary defender to all sorts of pathogens and viruses and bacteria and so forth, that actually gets regulated by your sleep. So a lot of work goes on in your immune system when you're in what's called your NREM sleep, your non-rapid eye movement sleep or sometimes it's called slow wave sleep. If you're reading any articles about sleep, you know, in a magazine or something, you might see NREM or SWS, which is short wave, uh, slow wave sleep. So your immune system actually gets recharged and regenerated during the night. And you think about the last time you were feeling unwell, maybe you got an acute infection or something. The first thing you wanted to do was to have more sleep, right? That's your body regulating your response of your immune system to allow you to have more longer sleep, particularly NREM sleep, to allow the regeneration and recuperation in the immune system. But when we get very, very sick with a severe infection and we have more pathogenic load, then we sleep less, our, our sleep is much more disturbed because both our sleep regulation and our immune regulation are trying to cope and they're trying to balance one another out. So the best thing you can do when you get sick is to sleep as much as possible to support your immune system. Muscle repair and um, reduction in inflammation really is triggered by sleep. And also what happens at night as well um, is that our brain's waste processing system, which is called the glymphatic system, that only works at night. So if you want to think about, you know, when you take your garbage out of the house to take it to the main bin, and if you weren't doing that every day, that would build up inside your home, right? So that's the same with your brain. Your waste processing system occurs at night and only at night. And typically within that NREM3 or slow wave sleep, which occurs in the early hours of the morning. So say if you went to bed about you know, 10 p.m. or something, it would start around 1 p.m., that really deep, deep sleep. And that's where your brain waves slow down and all the other activity begins in repairing your body. So if you want to improve your memory, your retention of information, you know, if you're struggling to, in, if you've learned something new, for example, and you're wanting to retain that and be able to, you know, reuse it at some other point, that's all about sleep. That's embedding of memories and also um, improving your uptake and cognition overall. 
And in our REM sleep, which is when we dream, that's when our creative um, cognitive process occurs. So, you know, they talk about how um, uh, John Lennon woke up with the song Imagine um, in he just woke up with it one morning. Well, that's in that and that's in that REM sleep in the early hours, or sorry, in the later hours of the morning. So, you know, if you're looking at about three, four o'clock in the morning, that's when you're going to have your creative processes. So it's very important. And the other thing I just learned recently, I was researching this area, that a lot of gastrointestinal, so gut stuff, so all those gastrointestinal diseases. So irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel, Crohn's disease, and so on, they are actually improved with good sleep and worsened with poor sleep. Isn't that amazing that even our gut <laughs> responds to what's going on with our sleep pattern? So ultimately, every aspect of health is improved by sleep and it's one thing you can take charge of yourself and really make sure that you are managing your sleep health overall. Should we talk about what some of the reasons are that people sleep poorly, aside from the fact that they are not disciplining themselves to go to bed at a, a time where they can get the seven to eight hours? because I do run into that with some of my patients where they're simply not willing to stop what they're doing to get some sleep. And I have this chat with them about how important it is for their recovery um, to do so. But what are some of the, the other causes of what we call insomnia, poor sleep? Some people have trouble falling asleep. Other people have trouble staying asleep. They have interrupted sleep where they just have light sleep and they don't feel refreshed or recovered in the morning. Yes. So there's many reasons and often it's self-inflicting. <laughs> um, so the number one thing that I see with the majority of people is blue light issues. So using a device, so it might be your phone, your smartphone, it might be a tablet, a computer, because they emit blue light. And we, we've known this for years. So that blue light interacts with a part of the brain and then that stops the secretion of a hormone called melatonin. Now, melatonin, if you, if you think of melatonin, and I learned this from a sleep researcher called Dr. Matthew Walker, he gave this beautiful analogy of, if you think of uh, melatonin, like the um, timekeeper at the start of a, a race. So you, all the runners are lined up, ready to begin the race. And the timekeeper says, start, you know, and they all begin running. So that timekeeper saying start is your melatonin. So melatonin doesn't actually help you sleep deeply. It's almost like the trigger to say, right, now's the time to sleep. You're ready to go to bed. You're ready to switch off and relax and go to sleep. Now, the number one reason I see most people having problems getting to sleep to begin with, you know, this is called sleep onset insomnia, is because of the blue light, because that racing official at the start of the race for sleep hasn't been able to be triggered because of the blue light interrupting that signal. The other thing that's, that that's I, why I put these glasses on when you just reminded me because these are my blue light blocker glasses. Yeah, <laughs> I've got them as well. <laughs> yeah. So yes, when you're using screens, that's absolutely right. Wear your blue light blocker glasses and you can get them cheaply. You don't need to pay lots of money. If you don't yep. need a prescription glass like me, I need prescription, but um, you can buy cheap blue light blocking glasses. They are accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. the, um, use that always when you're using devices, but the research shows that you must, must, must stop using all devices two hours prior to the time you want to go to sleep. 
in order for that melatonin to be able to begin its process, okay? So that's really important, two hours before. The other thing that is also an issue is bright lights in the home or, you know, bright lights wherever you are, you, maybe you're in a hotel or something before you're going to bed. So in those hours of the evening, when you're starting to wind down, don't be having big overhead lights on you. Try and have the lights as dim as possible. And you can actually download an app, a free app that will help you to know the the brightness in a room. And it's called um, uh, Lux, L-U-X. And you can download this for free. And it's a fantastic app. And you can assess the light in the room. And you really only want light up to about 200 lumens maximum. And most daylight is about 1,000 lumens, just to give you, um, you know, comparison. So you want the light as dim as possible. And so if you, for example, don't have a lamp or that, you know, in your home or in the hotel or something, put on a candle. You know, just sit there and relax with a candle. And the ideal thing is to not use any screens at all. And so if you are watching TV, you can actually buy these yellow light uh, glasses, these yellow glasses, and you can then use those to watch TV because they change the brightness of the light. So you want the blue glasses for what, looking at blue light screens and you can use a yellow glass just in the evening to dim the light in the room. So there's some of the main things. The other thing is caffeine, right? So caffeine, as much as we love to have a cup of tea, I'm English, so I love a cup of tea and love your coffee in America. Um, the best thing with caffeine is not to have that after 1 p.m., because it actually blocks the receptor in the brain for the hormone called adenosine, A-D-E-N-O-S-I-N, -E adenosine. And adenosine um, actually is your sleep hormone. It's the hormone that helps you maintain sleep. Now, if you have caffeine, it has an eight hour half-life, so it will be blocking these receptors. So the simplest thing to aid sleep and good quality sleep throughout the night, so this is called sleep maintenance because you're maintaining your sleep, is to not have caffeine after 1 p.m. It's easy, right? It doesn't cost you anything. You just stop having caffeine. And look, I know for some people that is like I'm swearing at them or whatever, but if you want to sleep, for all those health benefits we talked about, you need to cut out the caffeine after 1 p.m. And sadly, the other thing that affects those receptors is alcohol. And so you need to be aware that alcohol contains a lot of sugar and um, you need to be conscious that even just one glass of alcohol can really interfere with your sleep pattern and also your sleep wave, um, your brain waves. So that's an important part of what goes on while you're sleeping is the pattern of your brain waves and alcohol and sugar. So even if you're eating a lot of sugar in the evening as well, that will interfere with your sleep. So be sensible and think about, you know, cutting out the sugars in the evening, cutting out the alcohol and just saving those for special occasions if you want to have them. The other tips that you can do in terms of um, you know, helping with your sleep is making sure your bedroom is as dark as possible because this light issue is a problem. Now, I don't have blackout curtains in my bedroom, so I wear an eye mask. And that's the simplest way to make sure that you can block out as much light as possible. Just make sure that you always launder your eye mask regularly. You know, don't just keep reusing it and never wash it um, because you then might end up with some sort of eye infection. But using an eye mask can really help. Making sure your room is as cool as possible. Uh, the experts recommend about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, but it's very personal. The main thing is that you want to be aware that your body temperature changes overnight. So you want to be sure that it's not too warm or too cool. In around the early hours of the morning, your body, your core body temperature does drop. So you need to be able to have access to some blankets or something like that in case you need to pull those over you if you get too cool. But making sure the bedroom isn't too warm because that does really interfere with sleep. And being as quiet as possible, you know, so wearing some earplugs if needed in the room and, um, and no electronics in the bedroom. For those people that like to watch TV in bed, sorry, <laughs> it's not good for you. The experts say that you need to have no electronics in the bedroom for all the, you know, the reasons of the light, but also EMS and so forth. But you also need to be having this cognitive process that when you go to bed, you go to sleep. The bedroom is not a place to do anything other than sleep and have intimacy. That's it. So it's not a place to do work. It's not a place to write your to-do list for the next day or to do study or, you know, to um, sit there and talk to friends on the phone in the evening because it's got to be in your mind. It's, you know, it's this cognitive behavioral process where we know we go to bed and we go to sleep. And obviously exercise is very important for sleep as well. And we know that aerobic exercise, it doesn't have to be a full on one hour class of aerobics. It could be simply a nice walk. Um, aerobic exercise improves your perception of your sleep quality and also improves your sleep, but it's shown to be really good at making you realize, oh, I had a really good night's sleep. But all exercise is important for sleep. And ideally, I know sometimes the weather um, in some of those northern states in the US isn't always great for getting outside, but try to get outside and get some sunlight during the day. And even if you just went for a 10 minute walk outside just to get that daylight and signaling the switch off of the melatonin that's the key for why you want the daylight particularly in the morning otherwise you're just going to feel groggy for the whole morning and that's more important than ever now because so many people are working from home while we're you know uh, filming this video people many of my patients are now working from home and they don't they don't even leave their house to go to work like they used to. And I do hear from many people that they don't, they don't make any attempt to go outside in the winter if they don't have to, because it's, it's not pleasant, but I tell them to just do it anyway, because yeah. you, can't, you can't only exercise um, when it's nice out, you have to have some kind of habit or system of being able to do it. And you know, if you can't get out, exercise in your house, or at least, you know, get some sunshine through your windows when it's sunny out. The other yeah. thing I wanted to comment on that you were talking about the, the alcohol and caffeine connection, very often people are, um, when they're very stressed, they're using alcohol as a stress management tool, and then it affects their Stress affects your adrenal glands, which I, I call them the stress gland, right? The, the glands that produce adrenaline and some other hormones. And uh, when your adrenal glands are burnt out, they're, they're low functioning, um, you, you then feel the need for caffeine to get through the day, which actually makes them worse. So that caffeine, alcohol, just to make it through the day thing, there needs to be a way of managing your stress that doesn't involve harming your body with these substances, which then interferes with your sleep and makes everything worse. You end up on a vicious cycle. So we talk yeah. a lot about stress management on this channel because that's one of the main reasons that I see patients not sleeping well. And they, they tell me their, their brain won't shut off. 
So they're trying to, you know, keep it quiet and not and put their phone down and not watch TV, but they're laying there thinking about yeah. what their problems or what they're going to do tomorrow or things that, you know, that, that they have to solve. So yeah. one of the one of the things that I suggest people do is find some kind of stress management system that works for them, whatever it is. It could be listening to um, Tibetan singing bowls there that's very soothing or some you know music that changes the frequency of your brain waves um, and, and, and puts them into sleep mode or whatever it is, yoga, um, just, just uh, learning techniques for relaxing your physical body, um, which is, you know, what I, I had to do. I, I don't know if you know this, Amanda, but I have a, a son that was born with disabilities and he's, he had many, many surgeries. And um, I had to be in the hospital with him a lot. He had 18 mm -hmm. major surgeries and I would sleep by his side in the hospital. And in mm -hmm. order for me to actually sleep in that environment, which was noisy and, and, and my anxiety level was so high, I, I had to train myself to be able to relax in a very stressful environment. And it's, it has served me well because I can just turn that on when I need to. Um, and that's one of the things I, I, I teach my patients. The other thing that we didn't mention is making sure your bed is comfortable. Your yes. bed is pillow, right? Even my, um, even my sheets make a difference. I, I, I need really soft sheets. I sleep yeah. on mm -hmm. Yeah, and making sure your bedding is clean as well. And it, it's amazing how I've had patients that, you know, maybe uh, single, and so they say to me, well, I sleep on uh, one side of the bed for a week and then I sleep on the other side of the bed for a week. So I only have to wash my bedding every two weeks. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, no. You wash your bedding every single week. And it's also that process of making a haven of your bedroom as well. You don't need luxury beds or luxury sheets or luxury furniture or whatever you just need to create it in your own mind that this is a haven for you and this is where you go to relax and sleep and nourish your body so I talk to my patients a lot about that in terms of you know when you go to bed whether or not you walk up the stairs or you walk down the corridor in your home you're getting in the mindset already of going to sleep and you're doing your deep breathing. And I think that alternate nostril breathing, and if you're, mm -hmm. you know, people aren't familiar with that, Google it because it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But you can do alternate nostril breathing to really calm down your nervous system. It is free and it's quick and it's super effective. And yeah. The other thing I do, I exactly agree with you, uh, Corey. I recommend music or I recommend um, meditation apps. But if they use an app, I want them to use it before they go to bed, you know, not using it in bed. Right. And on some of the meditation apps, they even have bedtime stories. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lover of those bedtime stories, you yes. know, I, one story that I listen to a lot on one app put the Calm app, it mm -hmm. you know takes me to the lavender fields in Provence, France. You know, and I'm yes. visualizing. <laughs> yes, I mean if you want a bit of escapism, they're beautiful to take you and transport you away from your stresses and worries, and be in France in a beautiful environment, or be walking along a beach. You know, in the tropical island wherever it might be for you yeah <laughs> but stress yes. you, you've hit on such a, an important topic we are all very very stressed in this world right and we all have different mechanisms for dealing with stress and we all have different levels of resilience when it comes to stress and at times in life we might have a lot of things hit us that occur all in one go like the death of a loved one or um, a divorce or, you know, 
child, you know, rearing children issues, whatever it might be, it might all compound and we find our resilience slipping. And then that's when our sleep pattern can get out of whack. We can feel very frayed and irritable. And I think it's very important that we do the, the cognitive processes we need to, like you talked about, you trained yourself when you were in that very stressful environment in the hospital. But it's also important to take some aids that we might need. And I'm a lover of plants, you know, botanicals, medicinal plants. So some of my favorites would be kava, um, the magical plant from the South Pacific Islands. So let's all imagine ourselves there in the South Pacific Islands now. And this plant has been used for thousands of years and is highly revered in that culture. And it's a plant that's used for um, it's called the, the peace herb or the, you know, the peace elixir. I call it the happiness herb because it really helps to calm down anxiety, really bring you back to a point of balance. You can still have your crazy world going on and all the stuff you have to deal with, but you feel like you're able to deal with it. Now, there's lots of different Carver products on the market, um, but you need to be sure that you're getting a really good quality, what's called a noble cultivar of Carver. And I'm sure Dr. Corey can recommend, you know, separate to this video, what, what she uses. But the key thing, we use the same ones, um, but it's, it's really important to use a good quality Carver. And it has had great scientific studies done on it for, uh, a very serious condition called generalized anxiety disorder, which is very severe anxiety for at least six months or more to the point that it really impacts your ability to function in life, right? That's how severe it is. So you can use Carver for just temporary anxiety, just feeling a bit <gasps> racy and a bit panicky. You know, maybe you're writing your list at night thinking, oh my gosh, I've got so much to do and I don't know how I'm going to get through it. Carver's brilliant for just bringing that back down to normal and it actually helps with sleep as well and it relaxes your muscles so if you're feeling oh, stressed you can then take some carver and really help that relax and always I recommend magnesium in that situation as well it is the wonder mineral I think we should all be taking um, and then some other herbs that I love for sleep. Um, if you've got a very disrupted sleep pattern, for example, you know, you, life has occurred and you, you've gotten out of a really um, normal sleeping pattern where you're very disrupted, sleep maintenance is an issue or getting to sleep is an issue and you just can't get back into a regular routine, then valerian, uh, passion flower, and a Chinese herb called um, Zizifus um, are fantastic, you know, to help with resetting that very disturbed sleep pattern and getting you back into a lovely sleep routine. So I find them really excellent uh, to uh, help with that. The other reason I see people having trouble um, sleeping is like you said, Corey, their stress uh, adrenals, you know, they're, 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 that stress gland that's just pumping out, trying to keep up with the crazy schedule and doing everything, they're just depleted. And they're just, the, the little adrenals are saying, please, can we have a rest? You know, can we have a week of work and just sleep? But you've got to keep going, right? We've all got very busy lives. And so supporting those adrenals uh, is very important. One of my favorites is a, an Ayurvedic herb from a wonderful traditional Indian culture. Um, or it's called Ashwagandha. And it just sounds magical. It sounds like you're saying abracadabra. <laughs> Ashwagandha. <laughs> and it's just the most beautiful herb for helping to restore energy but meanwhile, keeping you calm. So it doesn't hype you up. It brings back that resilience of energy, but also keeps you calm from a mood perspective. And it also helps with sleep as well. So that's a fantastic herb that 
honestly, I think all my patients are on that currently because we are all needing that extra resilience to deal with this crazy world we're living in at the moment. Um, some of the other ones that are my favourite for those little stressy glands and to help give you that extra energy each day. Um, there's a herb from around the North Pole called rhodiola and it grows in these really harsh conditions where it's like you know the arctic you know so imagine yourself being this little plant living on the scraggy rock you know in these very harsh temperatures extreme cold extreme uv light in the summer months you know where it's 24 hour daylight and this herb has inbuilt resilience to that environment and when we take these magical plants, it's been shown in science that these chemicals or these plant compounds, they're called phytochemicals, interact with our body. So this herb, rhodiola, is amazing for improving our resilience. But it's also been shown in studies to be great for depression and many other things. You know, it's been shown to improve your cognitive function and also um you know, just your stamina, resilience, accuracy in your work. You know, it's it's one of the most amazing herbs. And I like to combine that with something called Korean ginseng, which is one of the most highly prized herbs in China and has been for centuries for many aspects of health, not just energy. It's very good for the immune system, very good for helping you manage your sugars. So, you know, if you find that, you're craving sugars, Korean ginseng is actually good for helping with reducing that craving, plus another herb called Jim Nima, which is from India, that helps to cut that sugar craving out like nothing else. And so it brings down your need to be craving the caffeine and craving the sugars and the carbohydrates. If you're taking something like rhodiola together with Korean ginseng and maybe some Jim Nima as well. So you're getting that balance to help you push through the day. And then at night, you can take some kava or some valerian and the passion flower we talked about. One of the big issues I see in my office, and I'm sure you do, Dr. Corey, is the um, pain, like chronic widespread pain and that can interfere with sleep as well. And obviously, we like to get to the root cause of pain and understand what's triggering that. Um, but one of the um, herbal combinations I like to support relief of pain overall, systemically or just locally, is a combination of Jamaican dogwood, corydalis, and um, California poppy, you know, the state flower of California, that beautiful orange flower. So these herbs together have great analgesic effects. They're very, very powerful in helping to relieve pain. And sometimes that's what you need to be able to get a good night's sleep. And what the research has shown is that poor sleep, so disrupted sleep, actually makes pain feel worse than bad pain interrupting sleep. So, you know, got this cycle. Mm -hmm. So with that combination I spoke about, that actually is um, a sleep support as well. So you've got everything built into that one combination. And the other combination that you didn't mention that I take every night is Skullcap, Shisandra, St. John's Wort, and Saffron. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that, that I nicknamed Chilaton um, because it is the chill out formula. And I'm so glad that you take that because I do as well. I take that regularly. I actually just took it this morning. And um, it's a wonderful combination of very soothing herbs to relax the nervous system. And I first discovered this when I was a very young herbal student and I was trying to learn about the herbs and there was a lot of pressure and I took this combination because I was feeling very irritable quite angry impatient and frustrated <laughs> and it was magic it worked so quickly 
And um, so that for thereafter, I've used it on thousands of patients, literally, because it works quickly. So you can use it on an as needs basis, or you can use it for a period of time when you might be going through, you know, not such a great phase of life, perhaps, you know, you need to just have a bit more nervous system support to support your mood and help you feel a bit more joyous. It's also great if you've just woken up and you feel you've gotten out of the wrong side of bed and then you feel like a grumpy, you know. (laughs) I've used it for many people in that scenario. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I I like to keep an open bottle of that at at my um, office just in case. Yep. Ditto. I do exactly the same. And if Mm -hmm. I've got a patient that walks in who's a bit grumpy and fed up with life, then and just huffing and puffing a bit. I think, okay, you're going to have some chiloton and you'll be fine. And literally mm-hmm. it can work within the space of 30 minutes. It's that quick. Yep. And um, it, it, it's just magical. And obviously these plant chemicals that we're talking about here that we're taking when we take these herbs, we have grown up evolutionarily with these plants. You know, we've always used plants for food and for medicines. And so we need these compounds. It's just like we need to eat good food. If we're not eating good food, we feel ghastly. We've got no energy. We feel grumpy, etc. So the key for us is to understand that these botanicals or these herbals that we see in a supplement are exactly like food because we need to have both. And we need to have our food as in food that we eat, our whole food supplements and our herbal supplements. You know, that's the magic combination. Exactly. Everything that God has put on this planet for us to be optimally healthy, that's, yeah, that's, what I absolutely love and embrace about about foods what my definition of food is things that grow on the ground grow on a tree or have a mother and are minimally processed and then the herbs are you know powerful what you call phytochemicals to heal the body and um, the more biologically abnormal uh, we the more biologically abnormal exposures we have, whether that's electromagnetic fields or chemicals that are being dumped on us at, you know, everywhere you turn, heavy metals, all these toxins, the more important it is for you to have these powerful phytochemicals to help your body to handle them. And, um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the beauty of what we do. And I feel so fortunate to know about it. The, yeah. all, all of the, all of the herbs that, um, that you just mentioned are uh, specifically in formulas and uh, in combinations in a, in a product that, that I use for myself and my patients and every single herb that you mentioned, I actually take. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, uh, I have that I'll put in the, um, in the description of this video, I'll put a link. If you're interested in getting these products, these herbs, quality is extremely important when it comes to herbs. There are so many companies and products that claim that they, that they're, that they're having active uh, ingredients in their herbs and they're, and they're not necessarily, I had this experience when I was in chiropractic school, I was a little bit depressed and I was taking St. John's wort and I was taking a good quality St. John's wort and it was really helping me. And then I ran out of it and I bought a cheap, um, not good quality St. John's wort. I didn't know better then. And I became almost suicidal at that point. Oh, man. So I really experienced the difference between the quality herbs that had the active constituents that actually um, have the therapeutic effect versus they can put, the, you, you don't know the difference. They could be putting 
you know, stems and dirt in the bottle and you wouldn't know it unless you had had it tested. So yeah. we, Amanda and I only use the best possible quality. Um, it's all researched, it's all tested. So I'm gonna put a link uh, in this, in the description of this video, if you're interested in looking at it, um, you can actually take a look at all of the herbs that we're talking about. So um, I think that, it, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Well, I just would like to add that if you're not convinced about the benefits of sleep, I would encourage you to start keeping a sleep diary. And there are many that you can Google uh, and download. Um, and I'll send you my one, Corey, in case you, you want to, 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 to share that or you, you, um, Definitely. you have one yourself. But there are many you can download. So if you don't like the one we're, we're offering, then find another one. But use a sleep diary because I have found in my office that this is one of the most powerful tools to really get honest with yourself about your sleep and it really gives you a lot of information so it takes you five minutes in the morning to fill it out when you're sitting there with your beautiful cup of chamomile tea or maybe your coffee uh, <laughs> but fill out a sleep diary because it gets you honest with your sleep health and I want to stress to you that if you're not getting the recommended as an adult seven to eight hours a night you are at risk greater risk of one of the top 10 chronic health conditions. Now, when we say chronic, that can be lifelong. So if you want to live a healthy, long life, you know, really get serious about your sleep, start tracking it with a sleep diary. And I would encourage you to have a look at those botanicals we spoke about, the herbal supplements, but also more importantly, Go and see Dr. Corey. She'll get you sorted out. <laughs> or if you're in Australia, go see yes. Dr. Amanda. Um, <laughs> yes, we'll put your we'll put a link to your to your um, practice on on the description as well. Thank um, you. And, and I do want to mention when when we talk about sleep diaries, a lot of people track their sleep using a Fitbit or other device that. Um, emits electromagnetic fields and that device itself can be um, disruptive yeah. to your sleep. So we do not recommend that. No, we don't recommend that. And yeah. also it's a fraction of the information that you're getting if you actually fill in a sleep diary. The only benefit that those devices give you is that they'll tell you what stages of sleep and how much time you spent in each. But could you have had a better sleep if you weren't wearing that right. device? Exactly. exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's what I have found with patients. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and you're actually getting ready to go start your day now and see, you know, lots and lots of patients. So we appreciate you so much taking this time out. This was lovely and so helpful. And I learned a few things myself. And um, I actually asked Amanda um, if she would be willing to do a series for us. So we're going to, we're going to negotiate that. At another <laughs> and um, before I end, I just want to apologize for what was happening with my video earlier when it was, it got dark out and, and my video was, was being wonky. So sorry about that distraction. So um, again, please, if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button now. Please like and share this video. And we'll be um, hopefully seeing you all again very soon. And stay well. <laughs>